This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We are getting pretty deep into the WNBA season. And we've got a pretty large sample on all these teams now, which means we can start to dig into the data and outline what the key takeaways are thus far. Today, we're going to bring on Annie Nader of FanDuel Research and pick her brain on what she's noticed so far, how to transition from betting the NBA to betting the WNBA, and her top bets in the futures market and for Tuesday night's games. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here at Fan at the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonnet. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned by Annie Nader. You can find her on X at a Nader33. Find all of her work over at FanDuel Research. She's covering the MLB, NBA, WNBA, basically every single sport we've got. Annie is covering. So Annie, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, Jim. Thanks. It's a delight to have you on here for today. Now, we're going to talk WNBA, and that's going to be the primary focus. But you are a Celtics fan, so up to nothing Got to pick your brain. How are we feeling so far? I'm feeling as good as I could possibly feel. I mean, if you can't beat the Celtics when they shoot terribly from the three-point line, I don't know that you can beat them. I mean, I still think that Dallas will get one of the games uh, right. back home and because Celtics want to win on their home court anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm feeling pretty confident. Right. Now, I come at this from like the perspective of a, of a Minnesota, Minnesota sports fan, which is constant paranoia. So if I were up to nothing, I would be like, OK, no lead is safe. You know, we're we're running scared. But for, I feel like for a Boston sports fan, it's probably a bit different, given you've actually been able to taste success uh, at some point in your life, whereas I have not. So that, I'm assuming there's no paranoia creeping in at any point here. There's been plenty of paranoia with plenty of Boston sports teams. I just think that this Celtics team is like the whole season has been far and away the best team, best built team. Like it's just, I think they're just, they've been primed to do this since the start of the season. So that's where a little less of the paranoia comes in because I just know that they're the best team. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's good. I I like have this push and pull because like I lived in the Northeast for a bit. So like kind of like a, and I grew up a Jets fan. So like a semi resentment for like Boston fans, but I also like want you to experience happiness. And there are no Mavs fans (laughs) on the FanDuel research. And there are a lot of Celtics fans on the FanDuel research team. So like it's a weird push and pull, but pulling for you. I hope they can do well to at least make the Celtics fans over FanDuel research happy for a bit. (laughs) What we'll do today is dive in and talk about Annie's overall betting process, talk about how to make that switch if you're an NBA better and how to become a WNBA better kind of key things to notice as you're doing that, making that transition. We'll talk futures and we'll talk about the three games laid across Tuesday night as well. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. If you want some full thoughts on a WNBA or NBA game three between the Mavericks and the Celtics, we had Austin Swaymon on yesterday he broke down his thoughts on that game also serious prices at FanDuel Sportsbook for the Celtics and the Mavs find that on the covering the spread podcast feed tomorrow we got the U.S. Open preview with Brandon Gadula breaking out his top bets for Pinehurst on Thursday we're going to talk about the Euro 2024 with Dr. Ed Fang so massive week here on the show go search for covering the spread wherever you get your podcast you can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV plus dingers blasts moonshots whatever you call them everyone loves home runs with FanDuel's Dinger Tuesdays, you can love them even more. That's right. Dinger Tuesdays are back for another season on America's number one sports book. Just bet on a player to hit home run, and FanDuel will give you $5 in bonus bets for every home run hit during that game. As if you need another reason to love the long ball. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. Bonus issued is non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max bonus $25 per game. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. 
or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. 1-800-9 with it in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700. Visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call one 877 hope and y or text open y in New York. Now, Andy, let's kick things off here by talking about your process because it's the first time we've had you here on the show. And so I always kind of want to ask the guest what steps they take before they place a bet. So for you, when you're placing a bet on basketball specifically, what steps do you go through before you decide to place that wager? Yeah, so first off, I always want to start with gauging the game environment and the potential game environment. So I think the key things there are like pace, three-point offense and defense, and it's like three-point shooting is no longer a part of really the NBA. It's like the biggest thing, yeah. um, especially in offense, obviously. Um, the injury report is something that's really helpful too, just for player props specifically, but for just everything, you can get a lot of value in either the market having an overreaction or an underreaction to a big player being out. Um, And then there's some more like circumstantial stuff, like whether it be like a team's playing a back, coming up a back to back, uh, a little bit of home versus away stuff. I don't care as much in the regular season with that. Um, But for me, it's about casting like as wide of a net as possible. Um, And then with props in particular, it's all about implied probabilities. Now that can be as simple as like, how many times has that player gone over or under that line in the season and comparing that to the implied probability and the odds. It's usually not that simple. The markets are definitely a lot smarter than that. Um, But I think finding relevant splits can real and then getting uh, hit rates off of that is super helpful for me in my research, uh, specifically with uh, NBA props. So if like a, a player is playing, you know, the third fastest team in the league, taking their samples from, you know, against the top five pace teams in the league, top 10, finding a new hit rate off of that, finding a new average off of that. You can do it for plenty of stuff, injuries, you know, top three-point defense versus bottom three-point defenses. You can use the game totals and spreads. I think just finding as many relevant splits and then using that to prove like, oh, okay, like this implied probability is probably not where it should be. Once I have that, that's kind of where I uh, can see some value in some of those bets. And the game environment thing that you started off with is so important because like we're Mm -hmm. talking about statistical categories for props and it's hard to rack up stats without possessions. So I think that starting there and like that was the first thing you mentioned, starting there is probably uh, the key foundation that we should have for a lot of people just because the pace dictates how many overall Mm -hmm. stats are kind of available throughout the game. Yeah, of course. And I mean, like the pace in NBA specifically, it's so important. You can find really, really interesting stuff for like, you know, Steph Curry, for example, he's someone who if he's playing a top five pace team, his numbers are going to be like crazy. And the market, at least this season, they really didn't adjust for that as much as I thought they should have. So there are just certain things there where the pace can be really, really important. Okay. And you mentioned implied probabilities too. If you need help, uh, if you're, if you're a listener and don't really know what that is, you you know, how a minus 110 line translates to implied probabilities, you can just search for like betting calculators online. It'll show you like, okay, you plug in minus 110. That's, you know, whatever it may be percent minus 150 is 60% plus 150, 40%. You can like plug those numbers in and Price sensitivity is huge. So I'm glad you mentioned that as well. You know, talking about game environment, price sensitivity, both things, I think, as as people transition to betting in general, Mm -hmm. should be top of mind as always. Now, let's talk about your specific transition here, because you grew up an NBA fan, watching a lot of NBA and really being a fan of that sport. And now I feel like a lot of people are making the transition to being Mm -hmm. WNBA fans as well. And you've obviously undergone a similar transition here, but you've had a lot of time now to kind of dig into betting the WNBA. So I wanted to ask you, when you've been making that move from the NBA to the WNBA, what has stood out as being the key differences for you between betting those two leagues? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, which it's it's the obvious big difference, but it does have a big effect on uh, how we should bet these two different leagues. The NBA, it's an 82 game season. Like we'll see a ton of big injuries. We see a lot of people dealing with load management and all of a sudden, you know, LeBron's not playing because of whatever, because his calf kind of hurts a little bit. (laughs) Well, um, (laughs) 
And so you also see a lot more blowouts too. And so yeah. you could have like an over on something and all of a sudden that player doesn't get in the fourth quarter and it can, you know, we know how to get burnt by that. Whereas in the WNBA, it's only 40 games. There's only 12 roster spots on each team. So the games are, regular season games are a lot more important than the, than the NBA ones. There also is just a much longer leash for those players since every game counts that much more less people on the team also a little like blots are a little less prevalent prevalent unless you're like the indian fever for right now <laughs> um, so you can get a much better per minute project or minute projections for some of these WNBA players because it's even the best players even if they're up by 20 going to the fourth quarter the coaches usually keep them in so that helps a lot whereas in the nba like the minute projections aren't always trustworthy and they, you can sometimes get burnt on those. Um, so I'd say that was like, is the main difference in terms of how to approach them. Um, in terms of how the market treats them differently, I've been noticing that like in NBA, like if Jason Tatum's points prop is set at 26 and a half, if he has a really bad game or a really good game where he scores either 15 or 40, that next game, it's probably going to be set right back at around 26 and a half. Yeah. You might see a little bit of, you'll see a little bit of movement on the odds, but the number will be the same. For the WNBA, I'm finding that the markets are having a little bit of harsher reactions to smaller samples if a player does inordinately poorly or uh, better than usual. And so that's a place where I think tracking positive and negative regression, particularly with WNBA props, uh, is a place to find value right now. I like that thought process too, because it's a smaller sample, which you alluded to, mm -hmm. and we can feel good about the stability of things, given that they're playing more steady minutes and stuff like that. So when you're looking at a player who may have underperformed the previous game and trying to decide, are they due for positive regression? You know, how do you, because like, again, it's a smaller sample as well. So mm -hmm. when you're looking for regression, you've also got a smaller sample to draw from. What are you kind of looking towards to decide, was this down game a fluke or should we expect them to, you know, or maybe there's an, a legit downturn? How are you kind of deciding where that positive regression may occur? I think it's all about like, okay, has their usage changed? Has their role on the team changed? Are they still getting the same shot volume? If those things are all the same, there's been no injuries, everything else has been the same. They just aren't shooting the ball well, or, you know, Maybe they had a really good game, but it was like double over. Like there's just certain things yeah. there that, but I think if their usage stayed the same, everything on the team stayed the same, their role is the same, then that's a spot where, oh, if they've been terrible from the three-point line, but they still shoot a lot of threes and are historically a really great three-point shooter and their point line goes a lot down, like that's going to be something that I'm going to be interested in. Okay, definitely. I think looking for regression in general is good betting process. So I uh, like that for sure. And I think the stability of the minutes is a welcome thing to hear for a lot of people may have been frustrated at mm -hmm. times with the NBA yeah. this year. So let's take a look at the WNBA futures market. We got about a 10 game sample or at least a 10 game sample on every team at this point. So when we look at the futures market, Annie, we're already a quarter of the way through the season. So any yeah. value stand out to you in the futures market based on what you've seen so far? So the Connecticut Sun, I've been tracking this one for a bit now, about a week and a half ago, their championship odds were at plus 1400. They extended their winning streak. It went down to plus 1200. Then the Aces and Liberty lost a game down to plus 950. Stayed at that over the weekend. Then the Aces lost a big game on Monday and it's down to plus 750. Based on that, it can seem really sour to take this at plus 750 right now. I still think that they're undervalued in this market. The Aces are going to be the favorite until they're not. They're the back-to-back -back champions. But I think Connecticut, there's just too many paths where I can see them get a really, really good seeding. And that, so it's – and one thing about them is they have five two-way players, their starters. The, Alyssa Thomas is – we could definitely argue that she's the second most impactful player in the league beh uh, behind Asia Wilson. That's a so that's a really key piece. Dewana Bonner, the fifth all-time leading scorer in the league, is averaging like 20 points per game right now, and it's not really a fluke. Like she's just playing really well, and their other three players are helping make up the best defense in the league. I think that that I mean, to be honest, the way this team is structured, it sounds a little like a team over in Boston. So, <laughs> but it, so that's something I'm interested in, and also one thing to keep in mind. I don't think it'll have an effect in the playoffs, but it will have an effect on the regular season is that the Olympics are coming up. And yeah. so WNBA is going to be taking a month long break. When we look at these two top teams, the aces are have, are sending four players to the Olympics. It's their core four. It's their main four players past them. There's a big drop off and the Liberty sending three, the Connecticut sun, they just have Alyssa Thomas going. So I don't think that that's any, like we should be concerned that players are going to get fatigued. They'd be playing then anyway, 
But there is going to be some time where the Aces can't do anything with their team and Connecticut's going to have a month long break to rest and work on whatever they want to work on leading into the playoffs. I also think that um, with the Aces being five and four right now, at this time last year, the Aces uh, had their fourth loss in August. So this is a really like tough start for them. Obviously, Chelsea Gray's been out, so that's been huge. But I just think that we're starting to see how hard it might be to three-peat. Like it's only the only time it's happened in this league is in the inauguration. It hasn't happened since. So I just think that the Sun should be like, if I was to place put uh, a number on them right now of where they probably should be in comparison to how they could compete with the Aces and the Liberty, I'd probably have it closer to like 650. Okay. And so I'm still seeing value in this number, even though it's, you know, knowing you could have got them at plus 1400 kind of stinks. I always struggle with that where it's like, I know I could have gotten a better number earlier on. So I struggle mm-hmm. to bet it, even if it is still a value at that point. But there's a reason the sun is shortened, both because they played well, but also because, like you said, there's been at least some vulnerability with the Aces and the Liberty. The Aces, before that loss you mentioned on Monday, where I think minus 105 or minus 110 to win it all, they're now mm-hmm. down to plus 110. Liberty at plus 180 and the sun sitting at plus 750 right now. And the Olympics angle is also pretty fun. So I, I like that as well. Let's talk specifically about Tuesday night's games. It is a three-game slate in the WNBA for tonight. Andy, let's start things off with the traditional markets, spreads, money lines, totals. Anything stand out to you there for tonight? Yeah, there's one spread that I like, the 0-12 Washington Mystics plus seven. They're one of the better 0-12 teams I've seen. (laughs) They don't have they don't even like they don't have the worst net rating in the league. That's the fever. They've lost 10 of their 12 games have been decided by 12 or less points. Like they're seven of uh, 12 have been decided by seven or less points. They're just losing a ton of really close games. They're still not a great team, but they've been close every single time, basically. And that includes like they've played three games against the New York Liberty. One was uh, they lost by 11. The other two, they lost by five. Like they're competing with good teams. They just have not been able to close out. They've not been able to finish games. But in this matchup against the Atlanta Dream, like I'm, I've not seen nearly enough from the Dream to make me think that the, that Washington can't compete this time around. Like I do think that their first win is coming up soon. It has to. Like this just, I think they've had really bad luck with finishing games. I don't know that I'm ready to, Oh. take that just yet but I, yeah. I i'm i'm happy to take these points here i was going to ask if you were enticed by the money line at all right now they're plus 240 at fanduel sportsbook so it's an interesting number but like you said sometimes you know they're 0 12 for a reason so maybe not quite firing on the money line yet just good looking at the spread for now they have some like kind of wonky injury stuff where not, not a, a key player isn't necessarily hurt, but they have two people that are like coming in questionable. Sure. I don't know how that's going to work. So I think for now, I'm just like, I'll take the plus seven and. and All right. I like that. So the, that. that's the mystics uh, plus seven. You talked about betting on uh, positive regression. There's nowhere to go, but up for them. Uh, mm-hmm. So the mystics plus seven minus seven, minus one fourteen, where Annie is turning there. Any player props stand out to you across tonight? Yeah, I have two in that Mystics Atlanta game, actually. Um, the first one, Ren Howard, um, over 14 and a half points. This is a spot where we're seeing where we could really see some regression. So Howard, this is her third year for Atlanta, third year in the league. Her rookie season, she averaged a bit over 16 points. Last year, a bit over 17 points. This year is averaging a bit over 15 points. But it's just been terrible in her last few games. Has shot below average in four of the last five games. Even still, she's averaging a little over 15 and has scored 15 points in more games than not this season. So it's not like her something happened this season that's new where her role changed, her usage changed, any of that. She's just not been shooting well, and I think the market adjusted a little too harshly. If we look at last year, she played an all but one game for Atlanta, and she scored at least 15 points in 74.4% of those games. Washington, I mean, they're 0-12. They don't have a great defense. They give up the third most three-point attempts in the league. Howard has gone three for 24 from the high arc in her last, like, four or five games. That's really bad, but it also shows that she keep, she, keep, she, will, she won't stop shooting. I think regression is inbound. And even if it doesn't come from the three-point line where she's all of a sudden draining a ton of threes, it's a matchup that could invite that. And even if it doesn't, she's just – been scoring 15 points for Atlanta for too long and at too high of a rate for me to like not bite on these odds. Okay, so that is Howard uh, over 14 and a half points, even money at FanDuel Sportsbook. That's in the Mystics versus Dream Game. What was the other player prop you were on for this one? 
Over in player combos, uh, Aaliyah Edwards over 16 and a half points and rebounds. This one is wholly dependent on some injury news, so definitely wait off on that. But um, yeah, so um, Shakira Austin has been out for Washington the last four games. Aaliyah Edwards, the rookie, has moved into the starting lineup. She's been awesome in the starting lineup. She's been great for them all season, but just as her role got bigger, she's been performing really well. Her last four games, she's averaging nearly 31 minutes per game and 24.3 PR, combined points and rebounds. That's a pre- that's pretty drastic. She's Based on her um, points and rebounds per minute, she would only need to play 20, a little over 26 minutes tonight to clear this prop. She's played a minimum of 28 minutes as a starter, and as I mentioned, averaging about 31. And before that, she was playing a decent amount, too, off the bench, but, like, not in that range. If Shakira Austin ends up being out tonight, I really love this prop for Edwards. Austin's props aren't listed, so the market seems to be operating under the assumption that Austin isn't playing. If she does play and Edwards doesn't start this game, like, that'll change. So I definitely hold off until we get that news. But um, if Austin is out, Edwards has been doing really well and just been hitting this at a, at a higher rate. So she, Ali Edwards also hasn't won a game since UConn beat USC in the elite eight. She's been, <laughs> she's been doing well though. It's been a minute, but Hey, maybe yeah. we can get Ali Edwards and uh, get that, get that mystics first win involved here. Now you talked about situations where sometimes the market can overreact to news. So let's say mm-hmm. Shakira Austin is ruled in. We're probably going to see Ali Edwards props move down on the assumption. She moves, she moves back to the bench, but like, she is a key piece of this team. She's been playing pretty well, been getting solid minutes. Would let's say Edwards markets do come down a bit, maybe it's still 16 and a half. We're getting closer to, you know, plus money, you know, even money somewhere around there on the over 16 and a half. Would you look towards an Edwards over if Austin is in under the assumption the market corrects, thinking it may be an overcorrection, or would that move to being a firm stay away for you at that point? It would be a stay away if Austin is in the starting lineup and is like a full go. If Austin's coming off the bench and is on a minutes restriction, I'm I still like Edwards in the spot, just because Austin is, has big usage for them. Like, yeah, Edwards still gets time on the court, but I just if she goes down to playing twenty minutes, I don't like it at sixteen and a half. I need to get a lot better number there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So keep eyes on the tabs or keep tabs on the status of Shakira Austin. If Shakira Austin is out or coming off the bench, we can go to Aaliyah Edwards over 16 and a half points plus rebounds at minus 125. Also liking Ryan Howard over 14 and a half points, even money in the Mystics plus seven. That is minus 114 at FanDuel Sports. But of course, the Sun potentially win it all at plus 750. That is Annie Nader. Again, you can find her on X at a Nader 33. Find all of her work covering at Major League Baseball ball the nba the wnba over at fanduel research as well annie i appreciate the time good luck to you with the wnba tonight good luck with the celtics for tomorrow as well and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon thanks jim all righty again find annie on twitter on x at a nader 33 i am on twitter at jim sonis you can also find fanduel research on x i'll just go back and forth to the two on x at fanduel research we are back once again tomorrow to preview the u.s open Breaking down the top bets for that with Brandon Gadula. You can find that on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, FanDuel TV Plus, and the FanDuel YouTube page. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets on Tuesday. We'll talk to you all once again tomorrow. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 